Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Engage ICT. I'm Sarah Jane Crespo. I'm very happy to see everyone here tonight. We'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we are going to start with Tom Hine. He is the Public Affairs Manager for the Kansas Department of Transportation in the Wichita Metro. He represents the department on intergovernmental committees, participates in highway traffic operation programs, plus takes calls, complaints, and occasionally compliments from the public. He also serves as the manager for the Witchway Traffic Management Center, the cameras and message boards on Wichita's highways. He is the administrator for two local KDOT websites and just doesn't have enough time to properly address social media platforms, but he's trying. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very, thank you very much. It's good to be here. I, I, I'm guessing that probably most people in this room know about the Kansas Department of Transportation. We, uh, we manage about 10,000 highway miles across the state. Um, in Sedgwick County, uh, KDOT has four maintenance shops. We have two construction offices. Uh, we have a metro office. We operate about 1,200 lane miles of highway in Sedgwick County and the surrounding area. Um, and most of you, many of you drive those miles and maybe you're happy with them, maybe you're not. Uh, we get a mixed bag of response from people, but uh, the fact is we're, we're out there uh, building those highways and maintaining those highways and uh, inconveniencing drivers to a certain extent. Uh, but our goal is to uh, maintain that infrastructure for the movement of people and goods. And that's really our goal, uh, safe movement of people and safe movement of uh, commerce. Uh, we have right now probably 10 active construction projects going and I'm sure you have, have driven through some of those and, and been a little possibly inconvenienced by them, maybe a little annoyed by them, but they are all, they're all for, the, for the greater good of us all, so uh, just persevere through those. Uh, uh, we, like I say, we have 10, active projects right now and uh, probably the the biggest one is uh, i-235 and kellogg or us-54 interchange the first phase of that uh, the rebuild project uh, it's a massive project right now we have 10 different work sites going on just in that one project it's a three-year project a little over three years actually it'll be finished in the summer of 2019 so you have plenty of good things to look forward to a lot of orange barrels out there and and some inconvenience. Um, but uh, that's our largest project right now. We have uh, some others that we have partnered with, uh, the city of Wichita, the, the county, the uh, Kansas Turnpike Authority. In fact, we have one on East Kellogg right now out at Webb Road that is being administered by the city of Wichita. So this is a, a KDOT highway eventually that's being built essentially by the city of Wichita and then turned over. Uh, to KDOT. So, so we've got a lot of good partnerships and uh, we're glad for that. Uh, uh, the Kansas Turnpike Authority is another good partner. They are going to start uh, a project out at East Kellogg and Greenwich to the K96 interchange. So, so we have partnered with local communities, uh, the local other, other local transportation entities in Wichita and, and the surrounding counties. Uh, that's part of what we do. And then we try to tell people about those operations and what that might mean for your drive or, or your method of getting around. Uh, so we have a number of websites. Of course, KDOT has a, a basic website. And then we have some local websites that you can access some of the information about Wichita projects uh, and, and activities that we have going on in Wichita. We've got wichitakdot.org. We've got a special project or a special website just for that project out at 235 in Kellogg, and it's called 235red.org, and it tells you a little bit about what the project will bring to us in the next three years and what kind of impacts on traffic we'll have during that construction. So that's part of my job is to, to tell you about what kind of problems and, and solutions we've come up with to fix those problems out on the road and then how that's going to affect your drive. Another method we use is uh, the, the Wichway system, which is our intelligent transportation system out on Wichita, Wichita highways. Those are the cameras, the message boards, the traffic sensors that we have stationed out on the, the uh, highways that have higher numbers. Uh, 
We bring that into our traffic management center and then we uh, kind of digest all that information and then put it back out to you as drivers on our message boards out on the highway. So we're trying to help your drive. Believe it or not, we're from the government and we're here to help. So uh, we have some other ways that we're working with other local partners to help ease the pain of, uh, of driving highways or getting around Wichita. Uh, we, we're coordinating traffic incident management uh, techniques and trainings with the fire department, the police department, so as they work an accident out on Kellogg, say, uh, they are trying to work them a little bit faster so that we get you back to a normal situation on the highway. Uh, we are also trying to get them off the road a little faster because I don't know if you've noticed, but people are a little crazy the way they drive Kellogg. So hopefully through this incident management, we can, we can smooth that driving a little bit and, and make it safer for all of us. Uh, we have instituted some smart work zones out in our, our projects that are out on I-235, especially right now, and I get calls on that probably every week to say, why are you telling me that it's four minutes to downtown? I know that. Well, eventually during this project, it may go to 10 minutes to get to downtown, and we are trying to put that decision-making process into your hands to decide whether you want to take US-54 to downtown and accept that delay in your travels or whether you want to find an alternate route. So uh, we're working with other local partners to help uh, speed your or if, make, your, make your drive more efficient. Let's not say speedier because we have plenty of that already. Uh, but we're trying to make our transportation system on the highways in Wichita more efficient. And we're, we're using a number of those techniques to do that. And we hope, we hope you'll appreciate that. Uh, we're, we're certainly doing our best because the fact is we may not be able to build too many more lanes of highway. And maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's not a good thing. But the fact is we're going to have to start using our highway system more efficiently and, and that's where we're headed at the Kansas Department of Transportation. More of an operations efficiency system rather than just we've got a problem, let's build more lanes. So that is the, in a nutshell, where we're headed in the Kansas Department of Transportation, at least on the highways. We dabble in the other methods of transportation. Uh, we are kind of a pass-through agency for bike and ped trails. Uh, that money is pretty secure because most of it uh, is federal money uh, that we then share with local communities or, or build those bike and ped trails ourselves. Uh, we work with uh, rail trying to move freight and uh, other, uh, even passenger rail that may eventually come to Wichita. We're working towards that as well. Uh, we work in aviation, so, uh, and then we work in transit as well, and I think you'll hear a little bit more about that from Steve Spade with the city of Wichita. But, so KDOT is mostly about highways and bridges, but we do dabble in some of those other modes of transportation, and uh, we're working towards that. Uh, as probably a little bit more of our future, but we have a lot of miles of highway and bridges to maintain in the meantime. Thank you, Tom. Our next panelist is Annette Graham. She has a Master's of Social Work from KU and a BA in Social Work and Gerontology from WSU. She's a member of the American Society on Aging, the Kansas Mental Health and Aging Coalition, the Sedgwick County Suicide Prevention Task Force, the Wichita Arts Council, and several other groups. She's served as the president of the Kansas Association of Area Agencies on Aging for three years and was the chair of the Aging Committee for the Kansas Public Health Association. She works as the executive director of the Central Plains Area Aging on Ag Agency on Aging and the Sedgwick County Department on Aging since 1999, and is involved in advocacy, community education, program design and development, and planning at the local and state level. So to give us uh, her perspective on transportation and how it relates to those areas, welcome Annette Graham. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the human side of transportation and trans, transit for individuals. So in our agency, we've provided transportation and worked in these areas 
since the early 1990s. Uh, so we've had a lot of experience in identifying issues and needs for seniors, individuals with disabilities, and for the low-income individuals. And they all experience some of very similar barriers and obstacles, and we kind of refer to that as a mobility mismatch. So they have needs and they have uh, trouble accessing it and not having enough resources uh, to provide that transportation. So with the senior population, we're looking at from 2010 to 2020 in Sedgwick County, a 47% increase in that population. Um, and as that population ages in our community, many, uh, many people will outlive their ability to drive. So they're going to have mobility impairments, functional impairments, and sometimes it's a financial impairment that limits their access to a vehicle or their ability to ambulate themselves. Um, that becomes very much a problem when there's not uh, a robust community transportation service or a service that meets their needs. And so for the elderly and the state disabled, often what they need is, is exceeds the needs of the general bus system. If they can't walk to the bus, if they can't get up on the bus, if the bus um, stop is two or three blocks from their home, that's going to be a problem. Uh, the other thing that they experience a lot is we're seeing more and more of the community resources, the healthcare facilities are moving to the outside areas. They're no longer in the core of the city, they might be outside the city limits. So that prohibits them from using that type of transportation. Um, so it is a public transportation and transportation services is key aspect for individuals to remain in the community. They have to be able to access health care. They have to access treatment. They have to access groceries. They have to be able to get out for socialization because that is critical to all of us. We can't survive without that human contact. Um, when we look at the disabled population, we're also an increase, increasing growth in that population. Uh, and they are very um, dependent often on public transportation and other sources of transportation. So sometimes for both of these populations, it's door-to-door -door transportation. They need somebody to come and help them from the door, and sometimes it's door through door. So actually helping them if they have packages or, or things like that to be able to get through their door. So it's an um, enhanced type of transportation. But what we see happening for people is that if they don't have that access, then they don't have access to employment, they don't have access to the care they need, and that can lead to health disparities. If you can't get to your medical care, you're gonna have poor outcomes. It's gonna in, uh, result in increased cost, increased uh, utilization of emergency rooms, and different types of emergent medical care if you can't do that proactive. Uh, some recent information I looked at, looked at the population with disabilities. This is national data. And so when they looked at that, they said that there was um, 20, 20 million individuals um, that, weren't, that were not able to get out of the house with a disability. And out of those, 50, um, 50 million of that were due to lack of transportation. So that's a national figure. And it just kind of, I think, reflects what we see happening with um, the, the transit needs for this population. Then we look at the individuals with low income, um, and that unfortunately is a growing population, but without adequate income, they're not able to purchase a vehicle, to cover the cost of the vehicle and the gasoline and the insurance, and that impacts their ability to access. Um, through our agency, we um, also provide transportation. We coordinate a number of different funding streams to provide transportation to all of these populations. Um, and when we look at the transportation we provide, about 50% of that is for individuals to get to employment. Uh, so that's pretty significant, you know, and an economic contributor to our community is to be able to help people access employment and get to and from work. The next highest is the medical care, people needing to get to medical care. Um, as I said, with the senior population, it's, it's um, people outlive their ability to drive on average. A man outlives his ability to drive by six years and a woman 10 years. So that's uh, important for all of us to know. Uh, so as we plan and think, what would you do when you no longer have the ability to drive what are your resources? Have you ever rode on a bus? 
and for many that we talk to, they've never rode a bus. So learning how to navigate that system would be a challenge and kind of frightening for people. Uh, and then if you have a disability or some mobility impairments, where would you access that transportation? Um, and then when we look at people as they become transit dependent, a larger percentage of their income and resources goes to pay for transportation. Transportation is not a low cost service. So for people that are private paying that, uh, those trips can be very expensive, some um, for a cab or for a private resource. And we're seeing more and more of those private resources coming on board. You'll see vans around town and different people that are starting to provide that transportation. Uh, but that is a very costly service. And um, so these are very important issues. Um, what we're also seeing at the local level is a loss of resources. Um, limited funding, potential funding reductions coming down from the state, uh, federal dollars being reduced at the same time we have increasing population. So um, just recently, we've had a local service in our community that's provided medical transportation for seniors for over 40 years. Red Cross has provided that transportation. They provided over 15,000 rides a year. That was a volunteer-based program that they have done, um, like I said, for many, many years. That program ended in June. Uh, that is going to be a big impact for our community. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had some loss in the transportation services for this area surrounding Wichita, so those smaller communities uh, lost some of their transportation resources. So that impacts the people that are living in those small communities. And for all of Kansas, what we see, uh, many people trans, they have to commute from their homes, so they have smaller communities. They're coming into Wichita for the big hospitals and the specialized uh, treatment options. So we have this growing population in need of transit service, and we have a system that's pretty complex. So when we look just uh, at federal funding alone, there's 70 different funding streams for transportation. That's a lot to navigate. So for an individual who needs transportation, they often don't know where to start. So one of the needs we see is a need for a single point of contact, a one-stop shop, uh, so that a person doesn't get, they have an easier way to access and find those local resources. So these are uh, big issues. One of the things that we've, as we've looked at, what are some options and um, ideas to how to address that when we know that, that we're in an era of reduced funding and increased need and growing population, one of the options is for volunteer transportation. However, there are only two states in the nation that have laws that specifically address the issue of uh, volunteer liability immunity. So there are uh, issues as we've worked with different organizations trying to get more to get engaged and involved with providing that volunteer transportation. What we constantly hear, and this is across the nation, issues related to fear about the liability and how does that impact even if an organization or a church tries to start a volunteer transportation program, how that's going to impact. So there are states, two states in the nation that have uh, specific statutes that limit that liability and protect the volunteer driver. So those are some concerns and some issues that I think that we've uh, looked at as, as possible options to move forward and try to get more, op more resources. Uh, and then the other one is um, related to mobility management and travel training, helping people as they become transit dependent to learn how to access the resources, learn how to ride a bus, learn how to use paratransit, and help people access those services. So those are some um, kind of ideas, but certainly this is an issue that will continue to grow as we see uh, the need for people to have transportation and resources available to help those people that are transit dependent. Thank you, Annette. Um, what you said kind of made me curious. If I could take a poll here, how many of you have ridden the bus? Oh, hey, in Wichita, yes. Okay, well, that's not half bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know, in the last 10 years, I, some, Okay, well, thank you. I was just kind of curious about that. Um, all right, our next panelist is Phil Nelson. 
He started his professional career as a transportation planner with the Wichita Sedgwick County Metropo Metropolitan Area Planning Department and later became the first city administrator of Valley Center. From there, Phil moved to serve as assistant city administrator of Great Bend, then the first county administrator of Barton County. In 1988, Phil moved back to Sedgwick County to serve as the city manager of Derby. Phil's career in public administration also took him outside of Kansas in his roles as the city manager of North Glen, Colorado, and Troy, Michigan. In 2009, Phil became the president and CEO of the Columbia Association, a nonprofit community service provider, and Phil served in this role until 2014. Now, Phil is the director of the Wichita Area Metro Planning Organization, and so we're kind of going from more general statewide issues uh, into closer to home Wichita area issues. So, welcome, Phil. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some legislation that provides funding uh, for all 50 states, uh, as well as uh, some changes that are going to take place over the next 20 to 25 years, and it's based on demographic trends and some socioeconomic trends as well. Uh, the first piece of legislation that uh, is a, should be of interest to all of us is called the FAST Acts, Act which is Fixing America's Surface Transportation. That was recently adopted by Congress and signed into law by President Obama. The legislation provides $305 billion over the next five years uh, to fix up uh, the infrastructure of the United States. Seems like a lot of money uh, until you consider the fact that the American Society of Civil Engineers said it's gonna cost about $3 trillion uh, just to take the America's infrastructure from a grade D to a grade B. But it's a start in the, in the right direction. Uh, it again, is a, a five-year plan, and it's uh, kind of set to fix a lot of different things. And when you talk about transportation, you talk about roads, bridges, rail, pipelines even, and uh, some other very smaller, the transit and those kinds of things are also included in the, uh, in the funding. The biggest issue is that it doesn't take into consideration the trends that are taking place in the United States right now. And it once again is a one size fits all bill that kind of continues to perpetuate the same type of transportation systems. In terms of the state, uh, I don't know if there's any legislation that really impacts the state, but it's going to be, take a lot of fix-up for some of the things that are taking place. The sweeping of money from KDOT uh, is going to take a while to make up because not very many people realize that the state of Kansas has the fourth highest totals of highway miles in the United States. Only Texas, uh, California, Illinois have more highway miles than the state of Kansas. So there's going to be a lot of, of time to make up what's, what's happening and what will happen in the future because money is going to be tight, not just now, but in the near future as well. Uh, the demographic trends are going to be pretty startling to a lot of people because they are going to change what America looks like. In 13 short, short years, one in five people are going to be 65 years or older. I can feel safe because I'm already there, but uh, uh, another fact is Generation Y, or the Millennial Generation, and Generation Z will comprise close to 50% of the population. Those are people who were born in 1977, and the Generation Z is born after uh, 2000. Baby boomers will continue to comprise a significant share of the population, another 20%. So those three age cohorts are going to make up about 65 to 70% of the population. Uh, millennials don't necessarily want to own combs or vehicles. That's kind of changing in a way. Uh, Generation Z want to own vehicles, but not necessarily homes. Baby boomers are reaching the age of not wanting uh, to care for homes or vehicles. I can attest to that as well. Uh, and some of the things that are just taking place in Sedgwick County, uh, the comprehensive plan that was recently adopted by both the City Council and the Sedgwick County Commission 
states that population growth is going to be one or less than 1% per year for the next 20 to 25 years. That totals about 60,000 people over that period, or growth period. It seems like a lot of people, uh, but it's not really when you consider about 0.8% per year is the growth rate. Uh, at the same time, anticipated new housing starts in Wichita Sedgwick County are projected at 77,000 units. That means when you divide the 60,000 population into the 77,000 uh, new residence, residences, <coughs> that's a population per household of 1.28 people per household. The current average in the county is about 2.53. So what it comes down to is that about 40% of households will be single occupant. And here's the kind of the startler is the Census Bureau estimates that over 80% of households will be childless in the next 20 to 25 years. Another factor that's taking place is that uh, for many reasons, uh, more people in the 18 to 54 year uh, age cohort are moving out of the state of Kansas. As far as energy, and I'm not trying to be a downer here, I'm just trying to be uh, realistic. And uh, some of the experts predict that peak oil production is projected uh, to occur between the next five to 10 years. As far as housing trends, by 2050, 50% of housing demand may be for rentals. And 40% of Americans would choose to own or rent an attached home in a walkable community with a short walk uh, to work if it were available. Right now, less than 10% of America's attached housing fits that description. In terms of business, freight loads are anticipated to increase between 50 and 70% during the next 20 to 25 years. Why is that? Uh, because there's more brick and mortar stores are getting more web presence and people are buying more and more uh, goods and services online. At the same time, there are a lot of web-based businesses that are trying to uh, go into more brick and mortar type businesses so they can get a presence in the community and get more well known. Uh, a lot of web-based businesses are battling companies like Amazon by starting their own product lines. So where it's, they have to sell and people have to buy their own product or their products. Uh, the biggest factor I think we're gonna be dealing with here over the, the future is that we're gonna be dealing with five different generations of people and each one of them has their own wants and needs in transportation. Again, millennials right now are more interested in walkability. Generation Z, the kids that were born after the turn of the century, they want to own cars when they hit 16. Uh, baby boomers will probably never give up the urge to drive. I can tell you it's not that much more fun anymore, but uh, I think it's just that built-in need to own a car uh, if you're a baby boomer. <clears throat> what it really comes down to is are we planning the right systems for the future? I don't think we can really ever think that one size fits all anymore when we talk about transportation. Uh, there's more people that in younger generations that want to take transit. Uh, I think you're going to have to look at more uh, people looking at Uber and Lyft and even autonomous vehicles in the future. Uh, they're experimenting. Some of the companies who are, are starting autonomous vehicles have tested for over 100 million miles and feel like they're somewhat in a safe position, except they had a huge wreck the other day that one of us involved. But those are, are things that are gonna take place. And it's not necessarily the fault of the autonomous vehicle, but they're still involved in, in accidents. So there are things that have to be planned to take care of that. Uh, are we going to see a, a change in land uses as well? If you have a new population base that's sole occupant of house, our households, that is the household size is 1.28 persons per household. Are we gonna continue to build large single family residential units and are we gonna continue with urban sprawl? Uh, I don't think it's gonna be very feasible and very profitable for people to continue building large houses. I think there's gonna be a lot more infill development and some of the younger generations are willing to pay upscale prices for condominiums, for townhomes, uh, for apartments even, uh, and pay more of a price for them. 
Uh, right now, many of the communities in the, uh, in the Wampo region, which is all of Sedgwick County and a portion of, of Butler and a portion of Sumner counties, are reporting that more of their housing permits are for duplexes and, and uh, apartment complexes. So I think we're looking at changes in land use. We're looking at changes in wants and needs of transportation. So the biggest question that we're going to be asking at Wampo is, are we planning for the right systems? Do we continue to build roads and bridges, or do we look more at hike and bike trails? Do we look more at things that are going to have less of an impact on public health and well-being of, of the community? So those are the things that we're going to be concentrating on in the future, and a lot of it depends on the resources that are available, and a lot of it also depends on the legislation that's going to uh, continue uh, the legislators are going to have to start looking at maybe it's time for a change, maybe it's time for an emphasis look at less dependency on vehicles and more ride sharing, more van pooling, more walkability, and things like that that are going to make a huge difference of what we have today. Thank you very much. Okay, our next uh, speaker is Stephen Spade. He is the Transit Director for the City of Wichita. Steve oversees the operation and development of Wichita Transit, the city's public transportation system. Primary responsibilities include management of daily transit operations and guiding the long-term development of the system. Steve's focus in Wichita has been to create an environment for the transit system to grow, to meet the needs of the community by improving service delivery, cost control, and building local partnerships. Steve has 42 years of experience in the transit industry. Prior to coming to Wichita in 2012, he managed the transit systems in Des Moines, Iowa, and Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Steve has a bachelor's in political science from Indiana University and completed postgraduate work at Northeastern University as part of the Urban Mass Transit Management Development Program. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about uh, Wichita Transit, uh, explain a little bit about uh, the service we provide and then some of the key issues that we uh, are dealing with. Uh, our uh, focus uh, at Wichita Transit, our mission is to make sure that the people in this community all have some form of personal mobility so that they can take advantage of and have access to all of the great resources we provide in the community. And as you've heard some of these others say, there are a lot of people in the community that, that rely on something other than their single occupancy car uh, to meet that goal. Uh, Wichita Transit is a, we're a department of the city, uh, but also Wichita Transit is what's called the designated recipient uh, for the Federal Transit Administration, which gives us the legal responsibility to make sure that we're providing uh, trans public transportation services and transportation services that meet the guidelines of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, and that's a responsibility that's a regional res not responsibility, not solely within the uh, city of Wichita. We, we actually have a responsibility to, uh, to look at that throughout the uh, statistical metropolitan area. The, uh, our current operation does operate solely within the, the Wichita city limits. We have about a $16 million annual budget of that $16 million, about 3.4 of it comes from the city of Wichita, and the rest is a combination of federal, state funds, and uh, fare box revenues. Uh, we provide both fixed route service throughout the community, that's the big buses running down the big streets, and paratransit service, which is a demand response service that is designed to provide service to persons who can't access the fixed route service uh, because of their uh, disability. Our system operates about, we have a fleet of 46 buses and 24 vans. That's a bit under, well, significantly undersized for a community this size. Uh, other uh, communities that are similar to are operating instead of 46 buses, more like 90 or 100 buses in operation. Uh, we carry about 2 million riders annually. 
uh, let me tell you a little bit about who rides. Um, first of all, when you, when you look at, at public transportation, uh, as Phil was saying, there are a lot of reasons a community has public transit. And when you look at major metropolitan areas, all of them have a vital transportation system that's providing not only access for people that are transit dependent, but it serves the goal of helping to mitigate traffic congestion, promotes air quality, reduces the need for parking, and uh, is a more economical way for a lot of people to get around. If you're a moderate uh, middle income family, tra transportation expenses can amount to about 25% of your disposable income. So people who are on uh, have a lower income, uh, affordable, effective transportation is a real key. Uh, transportation, public transportation systems are also a, 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 an assist in economic development and help attract businesses because they attract millennials and other people that want to have something other than uh, a car at their disposal. In uh, the Midwest, uh, having been a product here for, for many years, we're car, kind of a car-centered society in the Midwest. Our development patterns uh, uh, tend to support that. So transit serves a little different role in the Midwest sometimes than it does in, in uh, larger areas. When we look at uh, the ridership in the city of Wichita, it's different uh, than we see as it fits the kind of your general community. One of the reasons is that the system is so undersized. But a traditional rider here that uh, uh, we look at our ridership demographics, uh, we find that it's a far more transit dependent population than we've got. We carry about 6,000, uh, generate about 6,000 rides per day. 50% of those uh, about 50% are uh, work trips and the rest are medical education and, and shopping trips. 86% um, of the people that ride the bus earn less than $30,000 a year. 50% of the people that are using the bus today don't have a car. 77% um, uh, of the people that ride are 35 or older. One of the things that tells us that the 40% or 50% going to work and the 70%, uh, 77 over 35 tells us that we're missing something that other communities have. Normally uh, in an urban community, closer to 75% of your trips are work trips. So it tells us, and, and we have, there's a, another skew where you have a younger population riding the bus. We're not meeting a need in that area because we're simply not providing a level of service or a quality of service that can meet the needs of people that want to go to work or that want to choose to ride. 85% of the people that use the bus use it every day to conduct their normal business. One of the issues we hear lots from people is, I have to use the bus five days a week to go to work, which means on the sixth day of the week, whether it's Saturday or another work day, another day, I have to get all my business done. So I've only got one day to get my shopping, my medical, anything else that's done. And then on Sunday, they don't go anywhere because we don't operate service on Sunday. Uh, we operate service from about 6 in the morning until 6.30 at night, which is, again, a very limited service. So that's a little bit about the system and who rides it. Um, we're facing uh, one key issue is people who watch the media probably know, and that's that we have significant funding problems uh, in creating a sustainable transit system. Our goal is to create a system that has uh, a solid financial base. It has uh, connections with the community that we're meeting the needs of the people that need the community and that we're serving the goals of the community in terms of whether it's the environment, education, or uh, economic development. Uh, we're working in three areas uh, to look at trying to create that uh, sustainable system. The uh, three areas are first taking a look at our cost centers, making sure that the service that we're providing is the most efficient, effective service that we can provide. We're stewards of the public dollar. We need to opt, do what we're doing uh, to the very best of our ability and approach what we're doing like a business. Uh, 
in addition to that, then we need to take a look at community need, make sure that we understand where people need to go, what services we need to provide so that we can match those resources with the greatest need in the community and opportunities for us to serve. And then finally, the, the third area we're taking a look at is funding. We've got to have uh, long-term predictable funding. So let me talk a little bit about each of those areas. Uh, first, uh, looking at the cost centers. Over the last three years, we have taken each one of the cost centers in our business and dissected it, taken it apart, and put it back together again to make sure that what we're doing is the most cost effective. We looked at our maintenance operation, reshaped the maintenance operation, actually improved the training uh, with our mechanics, and uh, uh, for, focused more on developing good, skilled mechanics in-house so that we wouldn't have to contract work outside that we couldn't do. As a result, with the same mechanical staff, we've reduced our cost of contracting out repair work by over $300,000 a year. Uh, we've looked at our fleet uh, in terms of the age of the fleet and the type vehicles we operate in terms of size, as well as the uh, fuel we buy. We've, we uh, took a look at whether we should burn CNG or diesel fuel. Uh, in doing that, what we've done is establish what the optimal age is for our fleet, established a fleet replacement uh, plan so that as vehicles hit a certain age, we make sure we're phasing it out so that we keep our maintenance costs as, uh, as low as we can. We've looked at our staffing levels, uh, actually completely reorganized our operation from the top down, and um, have focused on having a lean and mean staff with people who are specifically trained to do the jobs that they're doing. The other thing we did was took a look at our paratransit operation. Uh, uh, we had a model in which we were, we were operating some service. Five agencies were offer also operating service to serve their own uh, clients, uh, we've taken a look at that and are now taking a look at um, whether it makes sense to actually combine all of those different operations into one operation so that there's better coordination and more efficiency in service. And we're looking at, we know we're going to consolidate that operation and we're now uh, analyzing bids to see if turning that operation over to a private provider as opposed to doing it ourselves or is more cost effective. That, uh, we'll have that figured out in the next month. We've also taken a look at community need. Over the past three years, we've had significant public input trying to understand from the public where we're doing things right, where we're doing them wrong, where people want to go, where they don't want to go. And at the same time, we've taken a look at who rides, where they're riding, uh, when they're getting on the bus. And so we've started to design with the transit vision plan the kind of service that meets the needs of our citizens. What we heard from people is you, gotta, you can't stop running at 6.30 at night. Uh, a lot of people uh, have second shift jobs or people are working first shift jobs and could actually get a better job by moving to second shift, but they're transit dependent. We can get them to work, but we can't get them home at 10 o'clock at night. We can't get people to night classes after they work during the day or out to shop after they've worked all day. So we heard from people that you need to run like until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. We also need to expand the service. Uh, the city's grown, the transit system hasn't. So until th two years ago, we didn't have a bus at Newmarket Square. We just introduced bus service to Target. People shop at those places and people work at those places, yet as jobs and uh, the opportunities to get education, as, as Annette said, health care have moved to the edges of the city. The system hadn't grown, so, so the system needs to expand. Uh, we took all of the needs, it was interesting, we took all the needs that we got in the public input sessions and we put together a vision plan and said if the public, if we ran the service the public wants us to run, this is what the system would like. And it was really interesting because when we got done, the miles of service and the number of buses we needed was really, really similar to peer cities that we compare ourselves, those cities that were running 90 and 100 buses. They have systems that are already meeting those needs, and that's why they're running more buses. They're meeting more of the needs than we were. And when we finally 
started to build the system we need, it started to match up with Oklahoma City and Des Moines and Omaha and places like that that, that we'd like to compare ourselves to. We just implemented changes a couple months ago that are aimed at realigning the system to go where people want to go, to operate through neighborhoods uh, that, that uh, have people that uh, need our service more. So we're hoping over the next 18 months that we can start to reshape the system and meet need. The third area that we're looking at is, is our funding, and this is probably, uh, when you talk to all of us up here in the public sector, one of the, one of the greatest concerns that we've got. Um, the transit system receives federal, state, and local dollars for its operation, and then we also have fare box revenues. That's a three-way partner, three partnership in, in public funding. Uh, over the last uh, several years, the local uh, commitment for transit funding has remained constant. Uh, with the economic downturn uh, several years ago and the difficulties in rebuilding the city, the transit, transit levies or funds have remained at 3.45 million. So as costs have grown each year, we've had to use more and more of the federal money that we use for both operating the system and replacing our fleet to support operations. Uh, we are now at the point where we have to match federal money in order to get state, or we have to match local money in order to get state and federal money. Normally it's an 80-20 match. We are now at the point that we've maximized uh, the use of our match money we, we can uh, receive no more federal or state money because we've used all of our local money for match. In our peer communities, local funding comprises about 40% of a transit operating budget. Here it's about 25%. So the challenge that the city council's been dealing with is how do we start to increase our commitment locally to transit so that we can have, that's where the <clears throat> funding change has to happen to create a sustainable system. So a lot of our work locally is trying to find ways to generate additional local funds so that we can, can be where we ought to be in terms of our, our, our level of support. Um, as you know, the, uh, uh, local, uh, the sales tax initiative failed a year or so ago. Uh, we're now faced with another challenge, which is the property tax lid. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the city hasn't raised property taxes in, I think, 23 years. And um, uh, one, of the th one of the options for starting to build a sustainable transit system may have been taking a look at the property tax. And uh, the city no longer has a flexibility to take a look at increasing the property tax in order to, to meet the needs of the transit system uh, because of the property tax lid. So we're having to go back to the to the drawing board to uh, take a look at how we're going to fund the system. But again, managing those three areas, being good stewards of our, uh, of our public funding, making sure that uh, we're understanding and meeting the community needs, and then having a good solid funding base are the, are the key things that we're looking for as we move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, our final panelist for this evening is Dr. Elizabeth Abla. Uh, she received a BA with distinction from St. Olaf College, a Master of Public Health from the KU School of Medicine, Wichita, and a Master and Doctorate in Community Psychology from WSU. Elizabeth is an Associate Professor in the Department of Preventive Medicine and Public Health at the University of Kansas School of Medicine, Wichita. Her research interests include physical activity and healthy foods, tobacco, the built environment, and health impact assessments. In particular, Elizabeth's research focuses on worksite wellness with an emphasis on using policy and environmental prompts to foster a culture of health in the workplace. Welcome, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure being here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really nice to be up here with all of these folks. Uh, however, they know a lot more than I do. Um, and uh, I know something very, very different, and I think that's why I'm up here. Uh, so I'd like to uh, 
to first talk a little bit about why uh, when we when we talk about transportation infrastructure, the concepts that tend to be conjured up in our brains about what this is. We tend to be talking first about independence. Annette uh, really brought that up, that this is something that is not only an independence issue for when you are just getting uh, to the age where you're able to drive, uh, but it is for independence throughout your life that you are able to have, in fact, quality of life, which I think also Annette uh, really uh, brought up uh, we also have heard about businesses and how this is an, an economic driver and that we have to have reliable transportation in order to allow and grow businesses and build our economies. Uh, and you've also heard that we're changing priorities as different generations are coming to the, our communities that we're hearing, for instance, that half of the millennials uh, and, well, half of the United States Americans and three quarters of millennials are saying that they don't really want to be uh, driving very often, that that's just not a priority. Uh, so we have all of this at the same time that we have aging infrastructure and we have an opportunity to explore what are some possibilities. And so what I present to you uh, is that we need to consider health as a component of this. Uh, so there are a lot of ideas that are uh, being thrown at you thinking about independence and business and quality of life and uh, the, our economy, but there is another piece that tends to not be considered and that is health. Uh, there are health implications to everything we do and do not do. Uh, the way that, for instance, the infrastructure of this room was built uh, for, and, and the temporary nature, of course, of the chairs uh, and, and our setup was for you to come into this room and eventually, after uh, grabbing some food and whatnot, it prompts you to sit. Uh, that's the way that it was designed because we know that people tend to be more quiet and listening uh, when we're sitting. Uh, so we, we design things for a purpose and we design spaces for a purpose. Uh, what tends to be forgotten is the health component. And regardless of whether in, we are intentional in designing for health, we are designing with health implications, whether again, we're, we're being intentional about uh, bringing health about or not. Uh, I think we're also hearing that the uh, needs of, of transportation are changing, that we're really needing to have more, uh, I, won't, I don't know that options is the right word, but different modes of transportation uh, where our spending priorities have not. Uh, so we really have a lot of money put toward highways. And in terms of health, we know that uh, there are very negative consequences uh, with highways. Uh, and it has a very negative impact on our health. So when we think about uh, having greater amounts of space where we are expanding our communities, uh, we tend to, uh, it costs more, and it tends to uh, require us to hop in a car uh, as opposed or, uh, if possible, public transportation. Uh, and we're really, we've lost the sense of communities where uh, there are a few, I think, in Wichita that have really uh, continued to have uh, more of a multi-function land use uh, so that we're able to have the grocery store, uh, the uh, entertainment, the restaurants, etc., all in the same area that where the residences lie. <clears throat> so what can I offer to this? Uh, I'm asking you. No, I'm not asking you. Um, so so the, the thought here that I'd like to, to present is that there are policies that we can put together by resolution, by codes, by regulations, uh, by state law, uh, local. We have lots of uh, uh, different policy levers that are very influential in changing behaviors in which then impact our health. Uh, what is probably most commonly known as a best practice are complete streets. Uh, the concept of complete streets is that you are able to uh, have all modes of transportation to carry equal weight or value, uh, that you can safely walk on a sidewalk as a pedestrian, 
or run for that matter. Um, you are able to bicycle in your lane uh, that you, and that is protected, uh, that you have uh, uh, automobiles that are able to uh, be run in addition to public transportation. So it is not just um, the uh, one uh, owner of a car uh, per, uh, mode of transportation. When we think about other best practices, there are memorandum of, memorandums of understanding, there are uh, safe routes to school policies that block out specific spaces and identify what is safe so people can, kids and teachers and parents, can walk and bike to school. There are uh, comprehensive plans. We have master plans uh, in, in Wichita, we have both. We have a, a comprehensive plan, we have a, a master plan uh, for bicycling, and we also have a pedestrian master plan. Uh, and there is movement toward that. Another best practice in terms of policy is having an active transportation board so that people are, citizens are communicating uh, their interests and their needs around these types of topics. Uh, finally, some, some ideas around uh, traffic calming measures, uh, even the concept of, of uh, design standards. Uh, including the ADA, but multiple design standards that allow us to, as you were prompted without anybody telling you, sit down in these chairs, you are prompted to drive slower, to know as a pedestrian that you need to stop and look both ways. It's where it becomes intuitive. That's the kind of thing that makes me have planner envy, unfortunately, for every planner on the world and the planet. Uh, but it is a really fascinating set of experiences. That's what their brains do. They think about how, as a human, regardless of whether you're thinking about walking or you're thinking about making this buttercream pie, I don't know where that came from, but uh, that that is, you are able to stop and you're able to uh, know where you, where you are and where you need to be. Um, there are economic components of this as well, so when you think about your property value, if you have a bike path or if you have a walking path or a trail next to your property, your property value increases. Uh, it's the same thing around economic design and economic development. Um, if you are on your bike, you're probably, or walking, you're probably, you're a lot more likely to look and participate in your community and be involved in the retail that's there. So my, my final message to you, and I guess my, my underlying plea is to think about when we talk about Engage ICT, when we talk about how do we get involved in our communities, I, I encourage you to think about how the, the folks that are involved in this work create the plans. Uh, and and if, if we're going to think about electing individuals or if we are thinking about uh, the people who currently hold these jobs, if they're, they control the investments that we make. So if you are thinking about how do we spend these funds uh, to be able to communicate to staff, to the elected officials, uh, what are your priorities? I think the city of Boulder did an incredible job uh, by deciding that they wanted to bring everybody together and said, okay, citizenry, you decide what, how we spend our money. And so their investments were completely driven by the community, uh, saying that these are our priorities, so we want you to fund these things. I, I think that's a really interesting concept, and uh, if we could really truly get engagement in our communities, I think that would be a, a really phenomenal reflection of the citizens' interests. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Well, let's have another round of applause for our panel. Thank you, guys. Now, as we get going here with our discussion, uh, if you're thinking of questions that you would like to ask, we have little Engage ICT notepads if you'd like to write down your questions so you don't forget. Um, and we will do a Q&A after our discussion here. So uh, just to kick things off, um, I, and I'll, I'll kind of jump off of uh, what you were saying there earlier, Elizabeth. Uh, it reminded me of this article that I was reading recently uh, that said that America is having a walking renaissance. Um, and so, and this, all of these questions are for, for all of you panelists to answer or whoever would like to. Um, but do you think that uh, Wichita is having a walking resident, resident renaissance as well? 
and if not, should it, and why? So if anyone wants to jump in there. Okay, I'll go. Uh, yes, it should have a walking renaissance. Uh, that would be great. And we talk, in several of the panels, talked about livable, walkable communities. And that's very important uh, for all of our population because of the health and the economic and the social involvement and the social engagement. It reduces social isolation. And it really, I think, brings for that civic engagement. What we find with the senior population is when they live in communities that are walkable and livable, they are much more likely to get out in their community to engage in that walking and that is such a good health impact for them but they need communities where there is they can walk to um, like parks like you said if it doesn't improve the value but also they need a place that's safe to walk that's lit that has safe sidewalks that the sidewalks are kept clean and that they're even uh, so when we find those areas that we see a lot more people walking um, but they also need to, it goes back to the land planning and how to make these communities so that people can engage and get to the places they need, like walk to the pharmacy, walk to the, the, um, their church, they can walk to the grocery store, they can walk to those needed resources. And it helps for those that are transit dependent when they have that ability. And that also continues to help them be um, both independent but maintains their health and wellness because health is such a, uh, walking is such a good component of maintaining one's health and well-being. I, th I think we are seeing a more of a revolution in, in walking, but I think a lot of it is, is exercise type walking and recreational type walking. Uh, I think when we see changes in land use in the patterns of maybe more infill we'll see a lot more walk to work type, uh, maybe exercises that way, is that I think back in the 40s, 50s, people walked to work from home. And then it got to be where we spread out and spread out and spread out more and more. <clears throat> and it just was conducive to getting in the car and driving to work. But now I think there's a lot, of, a lot more interest in walking to work and having short commutes to work. And I think walking is, is gonna be one of the primary ways to, to get back and forth. I think as you look at the development of communities, uh, you see there's a, shifting, a shift in, in walking. Um, if you look more in the central city, the developments are more multi-use uh, in terms of you've got business, office, entertainment kind of mixed in with the residential that it makes it easier to consider walking uh, to do those things. When you start looking at suburban development as uh, it's traditionally been, uh, it'll be uh, a residential area that's separated. Um, so uh, I think a couple things, as you, as you look at suburban development, if we were more welcoming, uh, supportive of multi-use developments where you have retail office and residential combined uh, that starts to bring in that mix of people and makes uh, walking something that's a lot more a lot more conducive than it is in some of the suburban areas. So I'll just add on uh, briefly. So the Surgeon General has recently suggested that walking is the best way to get physical activity. It's an equalizer. Everyone uh, generally has access to the ability to walk, and uh, that tends to be uh, a, an, an e equity. Uh, Equalizer. So when we think about, um, I think very similar to what Tom was saying, there is this need to have this infrastructure built up around it. I mean, how many of you have been to New York City or DC before? And do you go there so that you can walk or to walk more? No, you go there to see the sights, to, to do the things, uh, but you do tend to walk more as a result of it. And, and that's, that's exactly what we're talking about, having that infrastructure set up so that's your default. It's easier, it's more interesting. Uh, you want to be doing it. It's not, oh my God, do we have to walk a block and a half to get there? Uh, it's instead, you're really thinking like, wow, we get to see all of these and we haven't seen these stores and what's that like? And oh, look at all those people. Uh, it, it just changes the, the dynamics. So it's not about this drudgery 
worry, do we have to? Uh, but really, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've been to DC where all of a sudden I'm not a runner and I find myself, I'm in a sprint, I'm wearing my jeans, but everybody else is running. So it's kind of exciting. You want to do that. So uh, it, it tends to be that kind of environment that we want to set up. So a follow-up to that, uh, are there some drivers behind uh, making Wichita more walkable and what are some of those big ones that we're seeing right now? I think a lot of it's going to be the change in the supply of natural resources. Our fuel is always going to be available in the, in the quantities that it is now. And price goes up, I think there's going to be a lot more I like guess a lot more change in what modes of transportation to use. I think there's going to be a lot more transit usage. I think there's going to be more walking, uh, more bicycling. Uh, but I think a lot of it is based on how far we have to go and <clears throat> our natural resources are going to be available always. You know, Elizabeth mentioned the concept of complete streets. Well, one thing inclu including complete streets is sidewalks. Um, you look at some developments here, uh, they don't have sidewalks, so they've only got sidewalks on one side of the street. That inhibits walking, and so the more pedestrian-friendly infrastructure you build as you're building the roadways, whether it's including uh, transit stops, uh, bike paths, or, uh, you know, amenities for walkers, which are benches and green space and things like that, those are the things I think they're going to help stimulate more walking. Just to add on to that, uh, the Dendrick design where we have cul-de-sacs, that does not in encourage walking whatsoever. We know it. Uh, we continue to build that because it's a lot less expensive. Uh, but the grid design uh, is the best way to promote physical activity, as active transport and recreational physical activity. So uh, part of the development community really does need to be uh, thinking about some of these health implications and how do we get pe more people walking. So I think one of the drivers has been, in our community, we've had a, a lot of advocates who have advocated loudly and been very engaged with the city of Wichita, and there's been a federal funding stream that's been dedicated and protected, but we've had some great advocates who have worked really hard, and the citizens have come out and supported that, and have come out and said what they want in the bicycle pass. So if we look over the last, what, 10 years, the, our bicycle paths, which are, are also walking paths, have just grown amazing. I mean, it is amazing to see what's happened in our community. And now that connectivity is happening where they're planning and making those connections so that you can go from communities to communities. We see the bike paths going out from Goddard and then going out to Andover and the, the railway pass. So I think we've had, I think that speaks a lot to the power of citizens and the power of advocacy when we have a group of committed people who can really make things happen and get their voices heard. Um, in the city of Wichita, uh, we've recently uh, begun an initiative that uh, includes all of the modes in discussion and review of street projects. So where traditionally public works is going to you know, uh, pave a street, they're just, they put together their curb to curb plan. Well now, transit, uh, parks, uh, bike and ped are included in a process to take a look at those plans and say, hey, have you thought about it? And uh, I think those kind of uh, structures that start to make sure that all the modes are having a, you, you can't expect a traffic engineer or a, a street designer that's been doing something traditionally for years to make the switch without some kind of dialogue with, with the others. So uh, I think that seems to be a, start, a step in the right direction that's really been, uh, we've enjoyed here. Thank you. Um, now, can you all explain the concept of sprawl tax and how it affects uh, cost of living? How would you describe the level of Wichita's sprawl tax? Well, I, before Phil jumps on this, um, <laughs> go right ahead. Uh, for, uh, let me let me talk about from a from a transit perspective. Um, you, you know, our cost is all related to miles of service and how many people we carry per mile. Uh, when we start to see 
uh, the housing developments and businesses and medical facilities locate farther from the central city and we increase the distance on trips, then our cost to provide service gets greater. Um, it, one of the huge issues I think uh, Annette touched on is the relocation of medical facilities to the suburban areas. Uh, many of those, uh, the people that use those services are either using the bus or they're using our paratransit service or a net service as well. Now we're carrying people from the central city where the preponderance of the elderly live farther these trips. And these are really expensive trips that we're running. So not only do our funds get limited, but now we're chasing destinations that are farther and farther away. So the concept of infill, uh, of trying to concentrate your employment centers is something that uh, that starts to negate the urban sprawl. I think being in city management for as long as I was, uh, you see a lot of the growth and development patterns going on the, the far reaches of the city because the land's cheap and it's easier to develop and all of a sudden you have to put in streets, water, sewer lines, storm sewers, all of those kinds of things. And not very many people realize that that initial construction is only one third of the cost of putting those inf that infrastructure in. The real cost comes in operation and maintenance, which is about two thirds of the cost, the total cost. And that's one of the things we're going to be looking at very deeply in the in the future, especially in next year's work program, is the transportation economics of what it costs to put in a street or revamp a street and what it costs to operate and maintain that street on a continual basis. When you start throwing all the, the street accessories like signalization, all of that in, it really starts to add up and the cost of maintenance of all that is just, it's the biggest share. And you see that more and more every year. You know, uh, another factor is population density. Um, we want our big uh, property, uh, big facilities, and the, uh, if you can plan for, I'm shuffling water, <laughs> I'm multi <-tiped. laughs> um, If we can uh, uh, start to plan our developments and our land use that will encourage higher density development, a lot of times the mixed use development in areas that, that will attract uh, a certain population, and then you're, you can also add development that's less, uh, uh, that's less dense, but what happens is then your transportation corridors focus in areas with higher development, your transit operates more effectively in areas with, with, uh, with, uh, with higher density. Uh, and so we can deliver our services much more effectively, and, and with good land use planning, you can have a little bit of both. I'm pretty sure this sprawl tax is not intended to go to the State Department of Transportation, but we'd take it. <laughs> Was that your transportation joke that you were going to say? <laughs> Sorry. That's you can share that if you'd like. <laughs> Um, how has recent legislation affected the transportation landscape in Wichita as well as in Kansas in recent years? So how has uh, the landscape kind of changed for, uh, based on the legislation that has occurred? There's just, there's just not enough money. That's the basic part of it. You figure there are 46,000 miles of interstate system. And like I say, Kansas has the fourth highest number of highway miles in, in the United States. Uh, and when you figure the, the $305 billion for the FAST Act that's coming out, okay, every state is going after that money. Uh, railroads are going after the money. In Kansas, there's 105 counties that are going after the money. There's 300 and some cities in the state that are all going, and I take that times 50. The money doesn't last very long, and it just, the bigger and bigger projects go because, again, the question, the previous question was the sprawl we keep spreading out. Uh, there was a documentary about Cleveland the other night that because the downtown has deteriorated so much, the average commute now to get to downtown Cleveland where the jobs are is almost an hour and 15 minutes because people have spread out that far 
when you do that, that's more four lane highways and uh, frontage roads and all kinds of different things that have to play. There's just not enough money to do that anymore. But if you go to places like Denver where everything is built around transit oriented developments, light rail is being put in. Different things that make a difference of how we're gonna stretch the limited resources we have. There has been s some good news in the legislation and it's been maybe a decade ago, but transportation funding used to be pretty segmented. So you had your highway pot and your transit pot and your rail pot. The, they, several years ago, introduced the concept of flexibility so that you, uh, surface transportation program funds can be used to build highways, bike paths, or fund transit projects. So there is a, a certain level of flexibility so that if communities decide they want to change their emphasis a little or put more money into one mode than another, uh, <clears throat> there is some flexibility to do that. Problem is there's not enough money to go around and it's, it's really competitive, but at least we've got the opportunity to have those discussions. Secretary Fox to the US DOT has come up with a lot of ways, different ways to distribute money. And most of it is based on new innovative ways of, of offering transportation services. There was just a, an award made to Columbus, Ohio of almost $50 million for different ways of offering <clears throat> uh, services. And some of it was autonomous vehicles, some of it was bringing in private carriers. There was some transit involved. But it was really smart and innovative ways that uh, he's trying to kind of generate the, a new philosophy on how to get infrastructure put into place that's not the same old, same old. Tom, anything you'd like to add about state changes or is it just that funding is shrinking and has been for a while or are there any other I would say that our funding has shrunk a little bit, but we have <laughs> diversified the way we fund projects. We are not just highway and, and bridge, and, and that has taken away from highway and bridge, but we do ped and, and bike trails, and, and we uh, had a ribbon cutting or groundbreaking just last week in, in uh, Garden City in Great Bend for a, a rail transload facility where uh, they will transport goods to those locations by rail and then they'll be offloaded onto trucks. I think we're going to see more and more of that kind of on-demand supplying and uh, our infrastructure needs to be in place for that and, and we think we're, we might be getting out ahead of one this time uh, by, by putting in these two smaller facilities. Of course there's another one up in Gardner, Kansas that's been, been being built for the last few years that it capitalizes on that rail traffic and then, and then using trucks only to transport those goods short distances. Uh, so I think we'll see more of that. And, and we're seeing some of our funding go to those kinds of operations that uh, will be providing those goods and service, well, not the services you need, but the goods that you need, they're coming from such large, uh, far distances now uh, we're, we're trying to make it as economical as possible for businesses to transport that. And maybe that's not the best policy uh, for the world to be transporting things so far when we could make some of those locally or, or possibly we could do without them. But that's the world we're in right now. And, and so we're trying to keep some of that traffic off of our highways, which is aging. Uh, by introducing these other modes, uh, especially rail, and we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, kind of a unique policy or legislation that we, that you're going to see impacting transportation services, kind of a different angle on that is through Medicare. So Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are changing how they're reimbursing for medical care. And Medicare is one of the biggest purchasers of medical care in our country, and that continues to grow with the aging population. But what they're doing is paying for outcomes rather than outputs. So they're moving from a pay for a fee for unit or a fee for service to an outcomes based on the actual health of the individual. Well, when they do that, what you realize is health happens at home, 
Health isn't just a result of medical care and your doctor's visits and your hospital care. It happens when you go back home. So one of the big issues that, that, that impacts health when you're discharged from a hospital or an emergency room visit is getting back to that your doctor for follow-up. So there's some changes underway that will pay uh, for more community-based organization services and more and more a realization of the importance of that transportation for that patient back to the doctors for a visit and out to get their prescriptions. Um, for the senior care locator, that's a national call-in center, the number one call they get from seniors is the need for transportation services. And what they, when they look at the outcome data for outcomes of health care, that importance of transportation <clears throat> to access medical care and follow-up. So I think you'll see more of those kind of different approaches that it will impact transportation, but that are related to that health. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to ask about prioritization, because there are so many, it's, you know, just the more we're talking, it sounds like there are so many different uh, uh, desires for transportation, uh, kind of conflicting desires in some cases. Um, and even just, Steve, in, in, in the case of busing, um, do you choose, uh, if, you were, if you could improve one thing, would it be to extend the hours or would it be to get more buses, that sort of thing? How, how do decision makers go about prioritizing so, when there are so many different issues that you're facing, and is that something that when the public weighs in, it has a, a large impact, or what are, how, how does that happen? How does that decision making occur? Um, you, you mentioned, I'll, I'll start. Yeah. Um, trans, when we look at public transit, uh, we, we take a look at the performance of our system, we try to get a sense of um, where the greatest demand is, uh, we're a balance between um, trying to take a look at uh, our opportunities to generate choice riders to businesses and that partnership with the community, and then also the social service aspect of what we're doing in providing service to the transit dependent. So there's always a balance for us in trying to figure out which, um, you know, the biggest, it's interesting, uh, right now, when we look at priorities, it's, it's usually related to service cuts. Uh, we haven't had an increase in funding and the opportunity to, to increase service, and what we've actually uh, had to do is go into the system and take a look at how each route's performing, uh, and then uh, systematically eliminate the portions of the routes that aren't performing well or carrying the fewest people. But one of the things that you have to do when you start to make those decisions is take a look at the demographics of the people you're affecting. Uh, so you can go through a suburban neighborhood with an average income of $100,000 and have three bus riders and maybe not affect them. You go through a neighborhood with people whose average income is less than $30,000, you know, taking that transportation service away is, is going to be an impact. So. Uh, it, there's a balance but for us between the business need and, and trying to match that social service. In highways, I, I think we're, we're kind of moved into a preservation mode, uh, not so much expansion and modernization. In fact, a couple of months ago, uh, a list of projects were announced that would be delayed because of, of funding problems. So. Uh, we are maintaining those preservation projects that, uh, that keep the infrastructure going the way we need it to go, uh, but we may see a delay in things like adding more lanes or modernizing some of the, the uh, outdated systems that we've got out there. Now, Wichita dodged a bullet on this one in, in that we didn't have any projects that were on that list, uh, but uh, there's no guarantee that that will continue, and, and Wichita certainly got a huge list of uh, infrastructure, highway infrastructure projects uh, accumulated. Uh, so how this is gonna play out in the future as we divert funds away from highway, as, as highway funds go down, uh, I think we're, we are going to be able to maintain what we have, but we may not see much expansion. And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's the right fit, we'll see. 
Uh, but that's, that's kind of the reality we're playing with right now. Those, the priority dollars right now are going towards uh, preservation of the current system, and uh, that's kind of the, the direction we went uh, as we worked with the Wichita Area Metropolitan Planning Organization as we outlined the MOVE 2040 plan. Uh, there was a real emphasis on maintaining what we have, not expanding the system. Uh, and I think maybe Phil might be able to elaborate on that a little bit more because that's a, a pretty important planning process document that, that we don't get a lot of public involvement on. Uh, it's not the most fascinating world, uh, but it is a necessary world. Uh, Phil? I, I think Tom hit it on the head that uh, the Wichita Sedgwick County Comprehensive Plan, our MOVE 2040 document, both are focused on preservation and maintenance of existing systems because that's the money that's available and modernizing, taking things, it's just kind of a luxury that <clears throat> we can't really afford to do now, but uh, the priority will remain for the near future anyway on making sure that streets, roads, and, and uh, other primary pathways or streetways are maintained to the best shape possible. I think another, just another comment on prioritization, it's pretty easy to get within our operation and make decisions on where to and not to run service. Uh, the bigger issue in Wichita is probably being faced by the city council in having to establish priorities between not only uh, different modes of transportation, but all the different services that the city is providing with limited funding and really limited ability to have any flexibility to meet need. So uh, where you used to be able to take a look at transit and say, gosh, we need to do something to put some extra funds there, with the limits they have now, the city council has to say, who am I going to take it away from? So what service am I providing now that I don't think is as important as this? So the, the city council is going to find itself in a really interesting situation having to take a look at those services that people absolutely, everybody consumes of water, police, fire, and then those public services are more a matter of choice. Public transit for some of us, not all, libraries, parks, all of those things are things that are as important to our community, but not everybody has to use them. So they, they fall, they, it just presents a real, I'm just, I'm glad I'm not an elected official at this point. <laughs> I'll just spend what they give me and do the best I can. <laughs> and just so that I can understand kind of the, the perspective here, some of the, the potential solutions to these issues are those things that you were mentioning before, the, the sales tax and uh, new ways of funding. Right. right. Okay. One of, the, one of the biggest problems is that very few people understand what they get for their investment, their annual investment through, through tax dollars. When you... Just look at the city of Wichita budget, you hear a number of $571 million, and that people, my God, that's a half a billion dollars. But when you start breaking things down, the property taxes make up about $277 million of that. And if you start taking the services that are available, the police protection is about, I think, $80 million, uh, which when you divide it by 384,000 people and you divide that by 365 days, you're paying about 61 cents per person per day for police protection. And one of the things I was looking at here in my notes was if people would pay 50 cents a day for transportation related services, transit, all kinds of different things, the population of our Wampo area is 520,000 people. That would raise $50 million a year for 25 cents a day. 50 cents a day, 100 million bucks. So at our 3 million a year, we'd uh, last we could, a while. We could probably it. give you a few more million after that. <laughs> we could probably do nice service <laughs> with that. But those are the kinds of things. That I think people need to know what they get for their services. It's, it's just flabbergasting when you hear the state of Kansas, $13 billion budget. But that's spread over 105 counties and all those different cities that are in there and the services that are offered. It's really not that much. Thank you. Um, I want to switch gears just slightly here. Um, really curious what implications 
might the onset of the driverless car have on all of these issues? If this becomes, you know, a real thing, what, how will that affect everything we're looking at here from health to planning to everything? I think there's so many different cause and effect that are associated with driverless vehicles. That, you know, how many DUI tickets are gonna be written? <laughs> Those kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> That's better than Phil's joke. That's right. <laughs> it's going to affect revenue in certain ways. But no, I, I think when they get the systems perfected, there's a possibility there's going to be fewer accidents. There's going to be people are going to be you know feel safer in, in going that. But right now, I just don't know that the system's been tested enough to do that, but. It's a wave of the future. They're not only testing cars, but they're testing 18-wheel diesel trucks and trailers. Yeah. But will this help? Uh, for instance, would you need fewer lanes on a highway when it's you know driverless cars? Will this help with the the, the layout, or do, is this actually a hindrance to you know the the habit of walking and bicycling? Um, how how might those play against each other? I know we're sort of speculating here, but. If anyone can, it's you guys <laughs> on this topic. Well, there is that idea that vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure uh, can make us more efficient out on the roads. Uh, I know the trucking industry is pretty excited about it, uh, to be able to really group their trucks and take advantage of the physics of, of wind and, and how they transport down, down a highway over a long distance uh, for efficiency and speed and safety. Uh, so I think we're gonna see some of those things and, and uh, we, uh, departments of transportation around the country are bracing for that and we don't know exactly how it's all gonna play out. It's gonna happen pretty quickly, we think. Uh, it's coming quicker than we thought. Uh, we are already able to gather data from vehicles that are going down the, the road now, uh, from cell phone, Bluetooth technology, to vehicles that are already providing some of that information. Uh, in Kansas, we are considering the way our, our budget is right now. I'm not sure we're gonna be expanding out too much to take advantage of this right away until we kind of sort through those technologies. But there are some federal programs out there, some grants that have gone to other states that are, are trying to figure out how it's going to work. Uh, driverless cars, uh, vehicle to vehicle, transportation or communication it, it's all coming and and we're not sure how we're going to be able to use that information yet but I think we will the US Department of Transportation is already looking at or finalizing some rules on on how the autonomous vehicles are going to fit in but you also look at drones delivering freight in the air on the surface it's going to be a totally different way of, of providing services now and I think uh, you're gonna have to, to look at so many different things that cause and effect that are gonna be, take place because of this, that it's gonna, it's gonna be a huge change. Well, certainly for transit dependent individuals as they um, live past their ability to drive, that would certainly a big, be a big um, boon and a big resource for people if you don't have to drive anymore and you just get in a driverless car. So I know that's something that, that they, aging industry has looked at and in um, disability, so that would be certainly a big boon. Uh, on a side note, I had recently read an article that the insurance companies are very worried about that because uh, for car insurance, they would, uh, with lots less wrecks, that would certainly change their industry world. I think there's a piece of this. I mean, we were, safety and efficiency, and, and that's great. But at some point, I'm not even going to need to get in my car to go someplace. <laughs> um, I don't have to even, you know, apply pressure to the gas or to the brake or move anything to drive. Like, I, I, I just I find it fascinating that we have continued to remove ourselves from any type of activity to be engaged in the process uh, that we just, it's so much more important that we're multitasking, doing everything else other than what we are supposed to be doing. So, uh, you know, I, I find it an interesting commentary as to where we are and what we're prioritizing. Thank you. 
Um, I have a question here, uh, a couple more questions, but one that I want to share from uh, a, a listener who had emailed me. Um, he wanted to know, have ideas for Wichita's transportation plan come from other big cities? Should we be getting ideas from other big cities? What are we, what are we modeling ourselves after? I think why reinvent the wheel? If it's there, use it. Uh, it's it's a pretty simple process that if somebody has worked on an idea, it shows that it works, if, especially if it's a similar size, similar population makeup, why not give it a try? And who are we modeling ourselves after? Which cities? I mean, do We're you looking, well, <laughs> we look at the different MPOs around the, the surrounding areas, Oklahoma City, Austin, uh, North Texas, uh, Omaha uh, and Mark in Kansas City, the Mid-America Mid Regional Council is kind of the trendsetter in, in, the, uh, in the Midwest and we look at them quite a bit to see what they're doing there and if it works, why not use it? In terms of transit, we have a uh, a group of what we call peer cities that we compare ourselves to. Uh, most of them are uh, either in the Midwest or there are cities that are similar size with similar demographics that include like Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Des Moines, um, Omaha, but we also look at um, Spokane, Washington, other places that are, that are similar in size. And then uh, there's, there are best practices for us on uh, how to deliver services in uh, denser populations, how to deliver rush hour services, uh, and then creative ways to look at uh, services during times of less demand. So we're always looking at the best practices of other systems and trying them here. For instance, we've tried to truncate some of our routes and introduce neighborhood feeder services that are concepts that are used in other suburban communities. And so we'll always be looking at uh, new ways to deliver more creative customer-related services. Did you want to add anything? Well, state departments of transportation are always networking with one another and cherry-picking ideas from others. As they become successful in one state, we might pick part of that project or, or that technique and try it in Kansas. We've done a lot of experimenting in Kansas, and we we've stolen ideas from all over the country. So uh, it's really a sharing process of best practices. Uh, and we rely a little bit on the Federal Highway Administration to share those ideas with us, uh, point us in the right direction. Uh, they certainly provide uh, grant funding for experiments. Uh, and then uh, people all over the country uh, are able to take advantage of that information. We're trying all kinds of things, uh, like I said, out in our construction zones. We're doing some smart work zone uh, technologies that, that the feds are really pushing. And, and in a metro this size and anything larger, we will always have uh, those traffic management plans for construction activities that require some kind of technology to push that information out to the drivers so that they can make informed decisions on, on how they get through a work zone or whether they even enter a work zone. Uh, so there's a lot of sharing that goes, goes, on, goes on between uh, state government, uh, transportation departments, uh, and, and I think we'll see continuing uh, those, those resources will still be shared and uh, we'll always rely on that uh, and try to, try to provide those techniques to Kansas drivers that uh, make things more efficient and, and a little bit safer for all of us. For the specialized transportation needs for specialized population, there too is a lot of coordination. There are a couple of national associations, the National Center for Senior Transportation, Easter Seal Society. Then there's the coordinated transit districts within the state. There's uh, nine regions now for that. So we work with across those systems, a lot of networking, a lot of looking at different resources, different models of doing business. There are, um, like I said, when we looked at the volunteer transportation, going to, we go, go to conferences, work with different service providers across the state, but also at the national level, there was just recently some conferences um, 
the Highway Safety Board and some other organizations that put on. So there's always this look at what are other people doing, what are best practices, because um, for specialized transportation, as with the rest of transportation, there are challenges that we face across the nation. So we all have the same kind of issues and we can learn from each other and stealing other people's ideas is a very good way to do business. So we try to let others lead the way many times and, and let us follow. So um, we're all in that same place where we have to find better ways of doing business, find more efficient ways and, and better ways to utilize the the limited resources to help people with their transit needs. Are there other issues that so far we haven't discussed tonight, things that uh, affect all of this pretty deeply that uh, maybe just aren't talked about often or that, uh, that we just haven't covered? I'll say, uh, you know, I think we've talked a little bit about the budget, but uh, this is not just a state decision. There are lots of decisions that are made at the local level, and uh, they are critical to how we interact and what we do in our daily lives. When you think about uh, from the, the CIP, the Capital Improvement Program, uh, the, basically the, the mechanisms that uh, the city council and others are able to uh, Mod, moderator or to be able to facilitate in some way, uh, whether it's property taxes or the uh, local sales tax, uh, we're looking at about a $193 million that we are dedicating toward freeways, um, most of which uh, goes toward Kellogg. And uh, that isn't going to ever be complete. Uh, I think right now it's, it is designed to the three mile expansion ish, I think a little less than three miles. So, you know, you can tell me where I'm off on these numbers, but uh, it's from expansion from Webb to uh, K96 on Kellogg. That expansion is uh, slated to go through 2025. Uh, and that will be a whopping almost three miles, and that's, uh, you can tell how I feel about this. Um, uh, I'm right there with you. <laughs> uh, but that's a lot of money, and if you even just took 9% of that, uh, we would be able to get almost 150 bike and walk lanes. Uh, that's pretty phenomenal and and that's what the ma master bike plan has identified that you've you have uh, that's that's a, a next to negligible amount of funding when it comes to uh, the freeways but when you're looking at um, the, if we did our entire bicycle network of 770 miles uh, not it would use 91 percent of the freeway funds uh, so there would still be money left over uh, if we had 770 miles. So when we're thinking about the use of funds, uh, I, it's not just the amount. Um, it's how are we allocating those funds so that, uh, and, and what do we want? It's not just what kind of transportation do we want, but what do we want as a community? What are we prioritizing? Do we prioritize our community members uh, or do we prioritize our cars? Getting kind of feisty here. Any, Tom, do you want to respond to that? Or <laughs> anyone else? Sure. Have Pick you? on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what to say. Um, we have dedicated funding towards bike trails, and yes, if uh, if we abandon certain projects, there's no doubt that money could be put to other uses. But I think. Overall, serving the greatest number of people that are using that road right now, they want it improved. And we see traffic numbers every day of about 80,000 vehicles on that part of Kellogg, and, and it's, it's, it's needed to be at least modernized, if not expanded, and I think that's, that's where we're going. The, most of the Kellogg improvements that have been uh, the really large freeway improvements have been spearheaded by the city of Wichita with some of your sales tax money going towards that and then it's added to state funds and federal funds uh, to build that highway. Uh, I, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I do think one of the challenges is uh, as the priorities in the community change um, to want to look at things in a more multimodal way 
Um, one of the discussions that has to happen is we're, we're trying to maintain our highway infrastructure and, and they define that as we want to keep people, everything moving at level C. Um, uh, but the, the bike trails, the transit, uh, the pedestrian ways that have been su suffered through underinvestment in order to have a really multimodal community, we're going to have to make some decisions to start shifting some of those funds. And, and I think Elizabeth's point is uh, we ought to consider that shift. Maybe we slow down some of those things, but if you, if you want to have a multimodal community, then you're, you're, the, the way you divide up the funds is going to have to change. Thank you. Um, my last question before we go into the Q&A here is what can people do if they're, you know, they've identified for themselves what they value, what they're interested in, what they think the community should look like. Um, how are ways, uh, the, what are ways that they can get involved? What should they do? You know, what can they do if they desire? Vote. What was that, Elizabeth? Vote. Vote. <laughs> I think the, the beauty of local government is that your elected officials are so accessible. So. Uh, if you have priorities, I, I think you need to make sure that your elected officials know that. I mean, today, you know, it's easy to email and text and do all kinds of things, but show up at their district advisory boards, come to a city council meeting. If, if something's important enough to you, you, you need to make sure that you're spending the time to let them know what your priorities are, because they, they aren't, that's the way they respond, is they want to hear from all of us. We're we're going to do a different way of, of communicating. I was told once that there are four different phases to making a decision. And time one is when the issue is uncovered and, and researched by staff. Time two is when the governing body hears about it. Time three is when a decision is made and a solution is made. And time four is when the community hears about it. And then it's kind of too late because money's been committed and all that. What we want to do is try to do some surveys to find out what you want in a transportation system. While we don't have a great deal of money to deal with, we do have the authority to do transportation improvement programs and longer range transportation program programs to find out what you all want uh, in terms of a transportation system. And we want to move time four to between time one and two to where we're actually doing what the community says is important to them. And we want to build a two-way communication flow instead of saying, here's the solution, you'll love it. And a lot of times you don't. So, so it goes back to advocacy and voting. And I think we ha it's important to realize that there's lots of levels of government and lots of place to advocate. A lot of people um, I know are, are, don't know how to advocate or they're worried about how to do that, but the truth of the matter is we're all born advocates. When you're a baby and you cry because you want something, that's advocacy. So we all know how to do that because uh, that's what advocacy is, letting your wishes and desires be known to others. You know, you have the city government, you have county government, you have state government, and you had federal government, and all of those have elected officials. Then you're their constituents. The reality is they work for you. I do a lot of advocacy at the state and federal level, and I know that a lot of times when I'm calling and, and talking to people and visiting with them, that they will tell us that they've never heard from anybody on this issue. And they keep track of how many times they get those calls and what the issues are. So making your, uh, your desires known, uh, participating in the, all those forms of government, come to the meetings, come when there's op open opportunities. I think they've talked about the opportunities when they're doing the community planning. There's opportunities when they hear the budget for public hearings. There's opportunities when important bills and legislation is being passed. Uh, so there's a, those opportunities to let people know, but also this, it's about your desires, but it's also the stories. That's what makes the difference a lot of times is, what does this really mean? Instead of it's just a number, what does that mean for people, for real people? What do those stories look like? 
I think a lot of people don't realize how long it takes uh, the process to work to improve a highway or to build a bike trail or to increase anything in our transportation system. It takes advocacy early on and then continued through the process. Uh, this is an election year for many state legislators, for local people as well. Um, they won't mind hearing from you this year and they need to continue hearing from, from you after they're elected. Uh, we are in the seventh year of a 10-year transportation program in Kansas, which means someone is thinking about the next 10-year program, and that should be you, and that should be the legislators. I'm sure they have no idea how they're going to fund it, but for the last 27 years, we've had these 10-year transportation programs that kind of line out how the thing is going to be structured, uh, how we're going to decide what projects happen, uh, how we're going to evolve into uh, an agency that doesn't necessarily just build highways and bridges, that uh, does bike trails, uh, helps rail, helps aviation. So those decisions are going to be made in, I think, the next three years as we build, as we finish up the current T-Works program and uh, talking about it uh, on your end what you'd like to see in that kind of a transportation program in the future is, is pretty important. I think not just advocating, because I, I think that is an absolutely incredibly important component, but I think there's another piece of asking questions. Uh, and we tend to not ask a lot of questions. And I, I think it's a great opportunity to fuel conversation and asking, for instance, about what are the health implications of this or that decision or this or that policy. Uh, I think it gets other people thinking about things that they might not have been thinking about otherwise. So uh, I would encourage uh, all out involvement. You don't have to go to all of the meetings, uh, but I encourage you to find out about some of it and send an email or uh, give a phone call to someone who represents you because I think uh, having that level of engagement is, is critical. Some of your local representatives, too, will be approached by KDOT in the next six months as we do local consultation meetings with them, and they could bring your ideas to those meetings. So this is an opportunity where you don't necessarily have to go hunt somebody up. You probably know your local city and county representatives, and we'll be sitting down with them probably this fall, if not early winter, and saying, okay, what are the priorities for the Wichita region? So let your local people hear from, about what your priorities are and encourage them to bring that then to the local consultation pro, uh, meetings that they have with the Kansas Department of Transportation. Thank you all very much. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. And I'm going to dive around to the back here in a moment, but are there any questions in front first? Okay. And as a reminder, please be respectful of our limited time and uh, just give us questions and we'll have time for comments afterward. Stand if you would, please. Okay, um, we live in a car culture and we are building more bike paths, you know, build it and they will come. Uh, my concern is for the safety of bicyclists and a culture where people, my, uh, have to get from point A to point B, and it's the most important thing in their life. I had a history where my wife, before the bike pass, was honked at, and I'm wondering if there's any attempts being made uh, to market, a diff you know, be kind to bicyclists, whether it's behavioral economics, whatever it is, that can shift it because of the uh, disastrous impact of cars on people. I, I worked with a therapist who was, who was injured for life because she was out running and a car hit her. And my concern is, again, the more people we bring in, and it's not Portland, maybe, where we have this type of attitude, it's Wichita where we carry guns. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I don't, I don't have a, a lot of detail, but I can tell you that the uh, that multimodal group I was telling you about in Wichita uh, are having conversations about how to uh, distribute marketing information so that people are more understanding of how the bicycle lanes work and what to look for on bicyclists. I know there have been some 
discussions about putting together a marketing plan and they're even considering some, I know, some signs on buses that help educate people. So there's an effort going on and there's a concern uh, because you're right, as biking population starts to increase, as you see more bike lanes, then you start to get more feedback from motorists too about the inconvenience and you've got that clash. So they're aware of it and we're, I, I would guess in the next couple of months you'll see something. I think there is more and more thought going into the design too of like complete streets that have dedicated pathways that are not so obvious to conflicts with motor vehicles. So I think there's a lot more <clears throat> thought given to the safety of pedestrians and, and cyclists. You know, there are two concepts um, on the development of uh, biking facilities. One is to emphasize off-street facilities, and then the other is to have the mixed use. And I think if you've got feelings about one or the other, that's another thing that you ought to make as they have public meetings on what they'd like to see in their bike lanes and how they'd like to see that system develop to make sure you're providing that input. Okay, question here. Stand up if you would, please. It's really for Annette more than anybody. Uh, one of the programs you mentioned had gone, of course, was the Red Cross Medical. This was a national decision by Red Cross. Was there a big lobbying effort against uh, to Red Cross across the country to get them to reverse this? So yes, Red Cross did uh, has been working on streamlining their services. Um, and so this was a national decision to shed the programs that, didn't foc that weren't in their core focus areas. So I think our local service was one of only two that was left across the nation. Um, another service that they had just recently gotten rid of a year ago was their congregate nutrition program. So they used to provide services for seniors. So they have really, across the nation, really refocused and prioritized what services they do. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Good. Okay, we have a question here. Yeah, Phil touched on this. It's really municipal finance oriented. Um, most of this infrastructure, water, sewer, roads, has a life cycle about 50 to 60 years before it really deteriorates and needs replaced. Um, so looking back to 1950, Wichita city limits were 27 square miles. Um, they're now 163. Um, we're just now beginning to hit the, the life cycle where all this is replaced, and that's where all of our funds are going now, and we have a $2.1 billion shortfall. Uh, we're facing a tsunami of uh, maintenance and replacement. Uh, what's that going to do? Because the people who uh, built this system aren't going to be around to deal with it. Uh, what's it going to do to people like me, people my age, who are going to have to pay for this? Well, it's obviously going to cost more money because the, the cost to replace those systems, again, is going to be two-thirds of the overall total project cost. Uh, fewer people means more burden. So that's where it's going to take a real conscious effort in how we redevelop land use in order to maybe get away from some of the infrastructure that's, that's out there. I lived eight miles north of, of Detroit when I was city manager in, in Troy, Michigan. And a mayor came in who they had lost, at one time Detroit was like 1.6 million people. And the latest census had them at 700,000. So he was moving people if there were like two or three houses on a block who were, they were in good shape but the rest of the block were deteriorated. He was moving them closer to the city and vacating that infrastructure that was in there. And I'm not saying that was going to take place in Wichita or Sedgwick County or any place in Kansas. I'm just saying that there's going to have to be some conscious choices as to what we can afford uh, to build and what we can afford to maintain. And it's going to be some, there's going to be some tough decisions. I might add to that that what we have now we have. Uh, one of the things we ought to do is think about starting to slow down the growth. Um, and that means that, but at the same time, we want the population to grow because the population brings more property value, more taxes, and starts to generate the funds to rebuild the infrastructure. 
uh, one of the strategies that the city has uh, developed in their comprehensive plan is the concept of infill. And that is that you, you stay within your city boundaries, you look at vacant land and opportunities to fill in the vacant areas in the areas that are already developed. You don't have nearly the infrastructure cost. You can increase the density. We can provide better services at a lower rate. And then hopefully what happens is you generate, as the population grows up, you get po uh, uh, property values with more property being developed, more property taxes and less infrastructure to support it so that you, uh, you can actually start to turn that trend. But that's a whole change in the way we approach land use play, planning and urban development. Instead of sprawl, we want to look inward and see what opportunities we've got. So hopefully as this program that the city's got, the comprehensive plan takes off, we'll start to see at least a slowing of that growth. Okay, we have a question here. If you would. Um, the um, Citizen advisory groups and advocacy groups for at least 15 years have uh, pushed for the bus system to not be rerouted on a, or routed through the city center on a hub and spoke and to move to a, a grid system where they right. run up and down the major arterials. It makes perfect sense. Why does the city resist doing this? Well, actually, the plan that we just uh, implemented where we changed the routes is, is a step toward having more of a grid system. Uh, we pulled the routes out of the neighborhoods and started to extend them so that they, they actually crisscross each other. Uh, so where you used to have to ride uh, from the northeast part of downtown or the city to downtown and then get another route to go to the south, you now, for instance, can ride to uh, Walmart at, Bro at Pawnee and Broadway and transfer four other routes and not have to come downtown. So we've started to develop those nodes around the community. One of the challenges when you, when you start to go to a grid system with, with Crosstown service is that a good uh, connection, a good connecting services requires a higher level of frequency and that becomes more expensive. So for instance, I'm running a crosstown route on Rock Road once an hour. That bus it, it finds it very difficult to transfer to the six routes that it crosses. It probably ought to be running about every 20 minutes so that people can then catch a bus. Now what's, what happens now is you ride a bus from downtown, you get off at, at Central and Rock and you wait 30 minutes for the bus to come by. Well, you're probably not gonna do that. If you only had a 10 minute wait, you would. So uh, we're moving in that direction, it's slow, um, but uh, I think it's, it's slow work trying to transform a system and move it completely away. But, but it's a really good point. Question here. I'd like to, t the word that comes to mind is silos. We've been talking about city buses, which is a silo of money. We haven't been talking about school buses. You know, Southeast High School is going to open in a couple of weeks with 61 buses because there's no way to walk safely to Southeast High School. In fact, another word that we haven't talked about is children. If we were going to put some money from, you know, all these projects that are <laughs> going begging, we could talk about sidewalks. If there's a renaissance of walking, we can't do that safely in most of Wichita. 70% of Wichita, and that's my own estimate, doesn't have sidewalks, and it doesn't have to do with federal, state, or local money. I didn't do that. <laughs> it has to do with homeowners. Sidewalks are financed by homeowners, and in many neighborhoods, there are trees planted where there would have been sidewalks just so that there would never be sidewalks starting in the 50s. Do you have any recommendations, any of you, to address the health of children who could, if it were safe, walk to school? Well, I can make a, a, a couple comments. First, I can share an experience. Um, yeah, when, when I was in Des Moines, we did a, a program with the Des Moines School District and we took a look at 
where the school buses operate within their jurisdiction and where the fixed route buses operate, and we figured out that a lot of the kids that were riding the school bus could ride the city bus, was actually going the, the opposite direction from rush hour. Um, and uh, so we actually took over the service to all their middle schools and three high schools. And uh, kids were taught to ride fixed route buses and took them to and from school every day. Uh, they contracted with us. We gave the kids a pass and said, not only you ride it to school, you can use it on the weekends too, we don't care. A couple advantages that, first of all, these kids learned a life skill that they use, learn to use transit. Secondly, a lot of the kids that were being, they're using the bus to go from the central city to a suburban school could now participate in extracurricular activities because in the past they were stuck on a school bus that picked them up at 3.30. Now they could ride till 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Oops. It's contagious. He still wasn't, no. like, <laughs> he still wasn't my butt light, I guess. So. Um, so there are a lot of advantages to working together and we'd, we'd welcome the opportunity. I think one of the th dynamics that's going on right now is we're struggling to keep our system afloat. The school district is struggling to keep their system afloat and we don't have the opportunity to sit down and say how do we, it's just uh, a matter of, we're so focused on balancing budgets that, that it's hard to think big picture. Another editorial comment, I wish somebody would have thought of transportation when they built Southeast High School because transportation is a really expensive and risky component and I don't know if that was factored into looking at the development of that school and the impact it was going to have on their on their school bus structure but that's how about sidewalks sidewalks who's got the answer to sidewalks you as a homeowner can petition for sidewalk construction if it goes in the, the complete streets comment, or, or uh, I think concept, emphasizes pedestrian ways, and I know this multi-modal -group, group in the city is starting to raise that issue on street improvements where, you know, you're building a street improvement. A lot of times it's like, well, we'll put a sidewalk down one side of the street, and the multi-modal -group, group starting to say, we need to think more holistically. And so I, I, I'm hoping in future developments you're going to see a difference. Part of the challenge is getting back through the city and starting to take a look at those older neighborhoods and how you get sidewalks in them. You know, the center of Wichita As, is currently yep. being densely populated. You know, there's a huge building. And, and, and one of the reasons is that people can get around. They can walk. We are almost out of time. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, there's a question here. and. Uh, if we're quick, we might have time for one more. So would you stand up, please, sir? What thought have you given to breaking the taxi monopoly here in town and go to a more Uberized uh, public uh, transportation <clears throat> system where people can get individual rides to fill in where bus services are not available? Uh, that's a great idea. We're actually, um, right now, what we try to do with our system is is run the large buses in the neighborhoods that needed the large buses and then start to introduce uh, feeder services using smaller vehicles in, uh, in, this, in the less dense areas or areas that have less demand. We've been experimenting with our own vehicle, but I think during the next year or so, you're gonna see us reaching out to like Uber or Lyft to have discussions about how they may fill in for us either in less dense areas, running shuttle service, you know, the feeder services. Uh, they could also uh, provide services during uh, off-peak times when we're, we're not quite as busy or even start to meet some of our paratransit demand when we have trips. So I think there's a great opportunity for taking a look at that, and I think you'll see some of those investigations in the future. One of the things I, I, I just might point out, um, there's a role for Uber and there's a role for, for the fixed route bus system and we usually complement each other fairly well. They'll never replace the fixed route when you're running. When we generate 3,000 trips in an hour, uh, it's really hard to have enough Uber vehicles out there to serve that <coughs> need. But when we're operating 100 trips an hour on another end of the day, that's when they can really become effective. Okay, one final question for the evening right here. This is in the nature of a rhetorical question. Um, what is the purpose of a transportation system 
I'll give you the answer I think it should be and that I think it is. I think it should be to get people to work because if people can't get to work, your economy chokes. I think what the purpose that we are actually working towards is, we I'm driving really fast. Okay, thoughts there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. I think, well, I think it uh, talks about, I mean, again, uh, the comments about uh, we have this love with automobiles in the United States, and is that the only way to get around, but are there more effective ways? And uh, I think the entire transportation planning effort and what we're doing is trying to make sure that everybody has access. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's have one more big round of applause for our wonderful panel.